welcome to church. We're so glad that you could join us. We're going to sing some songs of worship to our God because we love Him and He is so worthy. You know, Jesus, He conquered death. He conquered the grave so we could have a relationship with Him. So come on, why don't you sing? Arise, my soul, remain.
I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone In your presence, Lord, sing it out, Holy Spirit Coming close 
has come in close Let us become more aware of you In this time of worship I want to take a moment together I want to take a moment of stillness with our God And in this time I want to share a psalm It's such a beautiful psalm And it encourages us encourages us to enter into that stillness with Him, into that quiet place with Him. Psalm 46, verse 10, and I'm going to read it now. The ESV version says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Passion Translation says, Surrender your anxiety. Be silent and stop your striving and you will see that I am God. I am the God above all the nations and I will be exalted throughout the whole earth. And then lastly, the message says, step out of the traffic. Step out of the busyness, step out of the traffic. Take a long, loving look at me, your God, your high God above politics, above everything. He is above it all and He calls us into this still place with Him so that we can know and understand that He is God. He is above it all and He will be exalted in all the nations and I really feel like God is calling us right now to step into that stillness. He's calling us to find rest in Him. So why don't we take some time to do that today? Take a long, loving look at me. A long, loving look at me. I am above it all. I am above it all. Him 
So come on, call it out.
chains fall, fear bow here now. Jesus, you change everything. Eyes healed, hope found here now. Jesus, you change everything. situation and circumstance in our life. We thank you, God, that you are here. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Hello there and welcome to Bright Church. My name is Charlene Lee and I am the events manager here. I have a few questions for you today. Are you new to Bright Church? Are you streaming in for the first time online today? If that's the case, I want to let you know that you are so important to us and we care about you and we want to make you feel welcomed. So make sure you fill in a contact card and one of our friendly team members will be in touch with you during the week. My next question is, what are you believing for today? There has been there's been so many things that's been happening this year and it's been a roller coaster ride but I know that God is moving in ways that we cannot even imagine. So right now in the comment section, let us know. Maybe you're believing for someone to know Jesus. Maybe you're believing for financial provision. Maybe you're believing for breakthrough in an area that we don't know about. Let us know right now. And if you are on Facebook streaming our services, make sure you click the like button and the share button because you don't know who in your social networks might need to hear the word of Jesus today. And uh, do that right now. Click like right now. Um, one of the reasons that we can continue doing our ministries here at Bright Church is because of your consistent generosity. People still need to hear the word of Jesus and that's one of the things that we want to do. We want to get it out there and we want to see lives transformed because of God. So if you want to give online to Bright Church, you head to brightchurch.com and you can give online. Now, get ready because we have a great message today and we are continuing in our All Tied Up series. Hey church, how are you? My name is Matt and I am the Grow Pastor here at Bright Church. And I have the awesome privilege of being able to preach to you today. So first off, I just want to say a massive thank you to our senior pastors, Pastor Ben and Pastor Sarah. Um, it is just such an honour to be able to preach and I don't take it lightly it's a big responsibility and I just want to thank them so much for trusting me with this I, it is a really big deal I think it's a big deal for me it means a lot and um, I just think we're so blessed to have them as our senior pastors 
they're two incredible people. They're great leaders. Um, Pastor Ben is a great man of God. Pastor Sarah is a great woman of God. So I just want to say thank you so much, Pastor Ben and Pastor Sarah, for this opportunity. And I also just want to encourage everyone watching this. Um, if you call Bright Church your home church, I just think it's really important for us to be praying for them as our senior pastors. I mean, they've got a big responsibility of leading us as a church, and I think that they need our prayers. So I just want to encourage you to be just, just praying for them. Add it to your list of things to pray for when you pray, um, because, you know, we want senior pastors who are full of the Holy Spirit, who have clarity on what God's saying, who are enjoying doing ministry. I think that's so important. So let's be lifting them up in prayer um, throughout the week. And I just want to honor you guys so much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Sarah, for this opportunity. I love you so much. We love you so much at Bright Church. And yeah, let's get into it. So we're continuing on our series, All Tied Up. And um, this is an awesome series because we're tackling the concept of religion. Yep, religion. It's that dirty word. Um, many people don't like it. And this, we've got some good reasons for maybe why we don't like it. I know um, Pastor Ben started off the series last week, and in that he kind of talked about religion. And there's a word used for religion, and it actually comes from the word ralegar, and that means to restrain, tie back, or tie down. So it's so interesting that the word religion is connected with God, because what you've got to understand about God is you can't restrain, you can't tie back, and you can't tie down God. So religion is something that doesn't necessarily um, deserve to be in our faith or even our church. So it's something that we need to tackle. And our goal in this series, if you're not aware, it is to get religion out of our church. It's to get religion out of your faith, because religion is just going to get in the way. And the topic that I'm going to be preaching on today is the topic of meeting with God. Meeting with God. And I'm so excited to be able to preach on this topic because it's so close to my heart. I've got to be honest with you, five years ago, when this became a priority in my life, my life changed. Because what I realized was, although I had been raised in a Christian family, and I used to meet with God, like I used to go to church. I went to Sunday school when I was young. I went to youth group on a Friday night as I got older and I was a teenager. Although I met with God in those places, it was never relational. So to be honest with you, it was more religious. And there's a big difference between meeting with God in a, relig in a religious way and meeting with God in a relational way. And when I started meeting with God in a relational way, in an intimate way, about five years ago, my life changed. I mean, I started getting excited to meet with God. Can you believe that? Like, I actually was excited to read the Bible. Like, come on. I, I, I think that's rare in 2020, which is sad. But I was excited the, to read the Bible. I was excited to pray. I was excited to spend time with God. And as I started doing that stuff more in my life, I started to change. My heart started to change. It was incredible. Um, God changed my life. And this is what I really, really believe. I believe if God changed my life simply through meeting with Him, He can do the same for you. So that is my prayer today. I pray that you get fresh revelation of what it truly means to meet with God in an intimate way rather than a religious way. And my prayer is that real life change happens because of that revelation. So hopefully you're ready to get into it. And I want to start off by reading to you a passage of Scripture out of Acts. So I'm going to be reading to you from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And just for a little bit of context, this is after Jesus has died on the cross, risen again. Um, Jesus has released His Holy Spirit into the world. We have the gospel message that is being shared and spread by Jesus' disciples, and thousands of people are coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And these people are passionate. They are hungry for God. They're meeting 
with God all the time. It's at the center of their lives. I, wanna, I just want to read to you um, a little bit, a little passage that gives some insight in what the church was like at this time. So it says this in chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, the apostles were those 12 disciples of Jesus, just so you know. And when it says they devoted themselves, they're talking about these new believers, these new Christians at the time. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And, and I love this part, get this part. And day by day, attending the temples together and breaking bread in their homes. So day by day, they were attending the temple and breaking bread in each other's homes. So basically what they're doing is, they're not just going to church once a week. They're not just doing small group once a week. They're doing this like every day. They are loving it. They are passionate about God. They cannot get enough. Can you imagine if church was like that? Can you imagine if our life was like that? It's incredible. It says, They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The early church were hungry for God. Meeting with God wasn't something they grafted into their lives. Their lives became centered around meeting with God. They didn't meet because they had to. They met with God because they wanted to. The early church, these new believers, these people who were so hungry for God, they weren't trying to graft God into their life. Their whole life was centered around God. You see, religious thinking tries to graft God in. But we're not supposed to graft God in. We're supposed to be grafted into Him. And there's such a big difference. Now, I'm not sure if you know much about the concept of grafting. Um, we probably don't have a whole lot of gardeners in our church, but maybe we do. Um, but I wanted to look into this a little more because I found it quite interesting. So I looked into the concept of grafting in gardening. And for those of you who are not sure what it means, it's basically when we have one species of plant and another species of plant and we combine them together. So we cut a part of one plant and we cut a part of the other and we stick a plant onto our base plant. We tie it together and then they become one. And why would we do this? It's because when we do this, we get the good aspects of DNA in one plant and the good aspects of DNA in the other plant, we bring them together and it brings about better results. For instance, better fruit. Now, the base plant is what we call the root stock. Okay, so this is um, the original plant and this is the plant that has the roots that go down into the soil. And then we also have the plant that we graft into the root stock and that is what we call the scion. So we graft the scion into the rootstock. Now, the early church treated God like the rootstock. God was the base plant and God was the one with the roots. And they grafted themselves into it. They were the scion and God was the rootstock. Where nowadays, what can tend to happen is we treat ourselves and our lives as the rootstock and we try and graft the God of the universe into us. We treat God like the scion. We treat ourselves like the rootstock. And I need to tell you today that that doesn't work. You can't, you can't graft the God of the universe into your life. Do you not understand that you are supposed to be grafted into Him. Your life is supposed to be an outflowing of your relationship with Him. Meeting with God isn't something that you're supposed to just graft into your life. Meeting with God is supposed to be at the center of your life and everything else should come around that. But we have missed that today. We've missed it. We've become religious about meeting with God. 
We treat it as tradition. We've forgotten that it's an amazing privilege. We need to start grafting our lives into God. We need to start treating God like the rootstock and remember that we, we are the scion. In Colossians 1.16, Paul says this, and it's really powerful. He says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. You see, you were created for God. You were created for God. All people were created for God and his glory. Therefore, God, I mean, shouldn't he be at the center of our lives? Shouldn't meeting with God be at the center of our lives if we are created for him? I think many of us treat our relationship with God as an additional extra rather than a first priority. We can become so familiar with our faith that we lose the wonder. We lose the awe. We forget that meeting with God isn't something that we have to do. It's something that we get to do. Have you ever had an appointment that you just weren't looking forward to? I had one recently. (laughs) A couple of months ago, I had an appointment with the dentist. And I got to tell you, I was not looking forward to it. Now, if you were at Heart and Soul a little while back, you may know why. And that is because it's been a little while since I had been to the dentist, so I was a little bit worried. And hey, I'm just going to confess it right here, right now. It had been over 10 years since I'd been to the dentist. Okay, so if you weren't at Heart and Soul, there it is. There's the confession. It's out in the open. It's in the light. God, please heal me. Um, Help me, God, in Jesus' name. So I I ended up going to the dentist. And the reason I did um, was because I was eating donuts with my wife, Who loves donuts? If you love donuts, put it in the chat right now. Um, Say, I love donuts. Thank you, God, for donuts. Put it in the chat. Would love some interaction in the chat, by the way. That's really important. And um, I was eating a donut, and as I bit into it, I was like, gosh, there's something crunchy in this donut. That's weird. Anyway, I kept eating. (laughs) Fast forward a few minutes. um, I was looking at myself in the mirror, as I do, and kidding. And um, something felt weird in my teeth. And I was like, oh, that doesn't feel right. And then I looked and I had a little chip in my tooth. And I'm like, oh, no, that was the donuts. So I bit into the fork and I actually chipped my tooth a little bit. And all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, I had a reason to go to the dentist. And I wasn't looking forward to it. It had been a long time since I'd been. I had this little chip in my tooth. I'm like, goodness me, this is going to be expensive. I was not looking forward to it. But thank you, Jesus. I went and all that it took was a little bit of filing And guess what, guys? I didn't even need any fillings and I hadn't been in over 10 years. So yes, the grace of God is on me. I have great teeth genetics, praise the Lord. But that is not the point of that illustration. The point is, I think sometimes we can treat meeting with God like appointments with a dentist. We can not be excited for it. We can dread it. We can put it off. We can ignore it. And man, that's just so crazy. It's crazy because meeting with God is the greatest privilege. It's an absolute honor. It is a total honor. It is an absolute gift. And I tell you right now, about 2,000 years ago, longer than that, There were people who would kill to be in the position that you are in. They would absolutely kill to be in the position that you are in. I want to read to you a little section out of Hebrews and kind of explain why. So I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 10 and read verses 19 to 23. And here Paul talks about how we should approach meeting with God and the privilege that it is. 
So he says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. At the very start of that in verse 19, Paul says something interesting. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Now, I'm going to stop right there and I just want to explain the significance of what Paul is saying. So, before Jesus came and did what he did, before he went to the cross and died, on the cross for my sins, for your sins, creating a way for us to have relationship with God, it wasn't so easy. You see, back when Israel were in the wilderness, wandering around, waiting to head into the promised land, God established something called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was this place um, where the presence of God was. You can kind of think of it like a really old school version of church. It's not really like church at all, but that's kind of the best Um, connection I can make there. So the tabernacle was interesting. It it was this um, fenced off area. And as you went into it, there were three different sections. First, there was the outer court. And in the outer court, ministry would happen. And that was a place where people of Israel could, they could go into that place and they could receive ministry. But then there were a couple of tents. There was this big tent and that was called the holy place. Now, that wasn't a place where anyone could go. Um, That was only a place where priests could go to give sin offerings and sacrifices. But then there was an even more sacred place. There was the most holy place. And within the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant and what was considered the throne of God. And in the most holy place was the presence of God. That is where God was. But here's the thing. No one could just go in there. In fact, if you went in there, and you weren't the high priest, the punishment would be death. The high priest would go in there once a year on the day of atonement, and he would go in there to make a sacrifice for the sins of the nation. So once a year, the high priest would go in to the presence of God and meet with God. So when the average person like you and me looked at the tabernacle, all they would think was, wow, I'm so separated from God. It would just be a reminder to them that they can't meet with God. But then fast forward, Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for my sins, for your sins. And in that moment, when you read the Gospels, it says that the curtain tore in pieces and this was the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place and that was the um, illustration of all of a sudden God being available to everyone because when Jesus died on that cross it removed the barrier between us and God now anyone can enter into the most holy place now anyone can meet with God that is why meeting with God is such an incredible privilege and yet we so often take our greatest privilege for granted the privilege of being able to meet with God anyone can enter into the most holy place thanks to Jesus we miss that we forget the privilege we have I wonder if our lack of motivation to connect with God is because we haven't matured past Old Testament thinking about what meeting with God actually means. Do you still think you need to go somewhere to meet with God? Listen to this. You don't meet with God in a physical place. You meet with God in your heart. I love date night. And date night is something that happens weekly for me and my beautiful wife. And what I've come to realize is, you know, we can meet together and we cannot really connect. Like we can go out to a really nice restaurant, 
We can pay a lot of money. We can dress up. The atmosphere can be amazing. There can be great background music. Um, the lighting can be perfect. And we can just leave with an empty stomach, not really having connected, not really meeting with each other in our hearts and connecting. Whereas we can stay home and we can just cook dinner together and connect as well, cooking dinner. And then we can sit down and we can just, you know, eat our dinner and have a really good conversation, spend no money and just wear whatever feels comfortable. And we can connect and we can have an awesome time and we can actually have a more intimate moment at home. And what I've come to realize is when it comes to meeting, you can put on a facade, like on the outside, you're having this great meeting, this really intimate moment, these amazing connections, but then on the inside, nothing can be happening. But then also you can meet with someone on the outside, it doesn't look like much, but on the inside, you're focused on one another and you're actually connecting. You see, meeting with God was never supposed to be this outward looking impressive thing where people would look in and go, oh my goodness, that person's so close to God. It's supposed to be a personal thing. It's supposed to be something that happens in your heart. And the thing is, you, you don't need to go anywhere to meet with God. No, 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 no. Meeting with God is something that happens in your heart. When you get your mind fixed on God, guess what? You're meeting with Him. And this is something that Jesus taught the Samaritan woman. And it is an amazing story. And I want to just share a little passage um, from John 4, which gives a little bit of insight on what it means to be true worshippers, truly meeting with God in our heart. So I'm going to go to John 4. You can go with me if you want. Um, if you have your Bible with you at home right now, why don't you put that in the chat and just show everyone how holy you are. Or maybe you just have your phone. If you have your phone, why don't you get your phone out and go to John chapter 4. So I'm going to be reading verses 20 to 24 here. And just for a little bit of context, um, Jesus is coming to the town of Samaria and he's told his disciples to go off and grab some food and he's just going to go to the well. But this is actually a, a prophetic um, encounter that happens between Jesus and this woman where Jesus is going to reveal to her that he is actually the Messiah, which is pretty cool. Because this woman, she, you know, she wasn't that special. Um, she, she was actually an outcast. And if you look into the story a little bit more, you'll realize because of the time of day that she's going to the well, it actually shows that she isn't well liked in her town. Because most of the women will go to the well earlier in the day, but she's going at a different time, which suggests that she's not very well liked. Um, also, in the conversation that happens before verses 20 to 24, we learn that she has been in relationships with a fair few men. So she's broken and she's going through stuff. And she is a little bit concerned about the fact that, you know, people can only really meet with God at that time if they were Jews because the place where you met with God was in Jerusalem. But she's from Samaria. So she's thinking, well, how can I meet with God? And Jesus sets the record straight. Jesus says that a time is coming where things are going to be a little bit different when it comes to meeting with God. And I love what Jesus says. So I'm going to pick it up um, right here in verse 20. So she says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what you know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship in. So the point that Jesus is trying to get across is the time is coming. When you're not going to have to go somewhere to meet with God, you will be able to meet with God anytime, anywhere. He says that true worship will be worship that is done in spirit and in truth. When Jesus says truth, 
his meaning that true worshippers, when they worship, they won't just look the part on the outside, but on the inside, their hearts will be focused on God and their attention will be on God. When Jesus says true worshippers will worship in spirit, he's talking about the Holy Spirit that is going to come because the Holy Spirit is going to be released and the Holy Spirit will dwell within people and that will allow people to connect with God in a supernatural way. Did you know that you are a carrier of the Holy Spirit? If you are a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is alive and in you. Therefore, at any time, in any place, if you get your heart focused on God, if you get your mind set on Him, you can meet with Him and have a supernatural encounter. You don't need to go to church. You don't even need to go to small group, even though I love small groups um, and you should be in one. But technically, you don't need to be in a small group. Technically, you don't need to be in church to encounter God. You know, you can go to church and completely miss God. You can. You can show up. You can head inside. You can grab a coffee. You can have a conversation. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking about a million other things other than God. You can come into the service. The worship team will start to play and to lift up God. And yet your mind's not on God. Your mind's on other things. You're thinking, oh, gosh, the guitar's a little bit loud, maybe. Or, oh, this isn't my favorite song. And your mind cannot be on God. And then all of a sudden, the MC comes up and you kind of switch off because it's like, oh, yeah, this is the boring part of the service. And then it gets to Pastor Ben and Pastor Ben is preaching an awesome God-inspired message. And yet you're kind of switching off because you think, oh, I think I've heard something similar to this before. And all of a sudden, you can get up and decide that you're going to leave early and not really connect with anyone because you know you're hungry and you just want to get home and have lunch and before you know it what you've done is you have come to church you've looked the part but you've missed God you never really met with him in your heart and maybe God wanted to do something in your life in that moment but because your heart wasn't fixed on God you never really met with him and he he never really had an opportunity to do something You see, we don't go somewhere to meet with God. We meet with God in our hearts. And you know, I just want to give you some practical tips for what that actually looks like in real life. And I'm not going to tell you, oh, this is what you should do um, when it comes to meeting with God to develop that discipline in your life. I'm not going to say, I'm I'm not saying that. What I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you to get your mind fixed on God so that meeting with God becomes easier. Because remember, you meet with Him in your heart. So for me, the first thing i got to do is i got to plan it. I say to my students, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. you got to plan it. And the reason i got to plan it is because my life, it's pretty busy. There's a lot of things going on. I've got work happening. Um, I've got my beautiful wife that i got to look after. I've got small group happening. I've got different meetings here, there. There's so much going on in my life. And surely I bet for you too, there's a lot happening in your life. Therefore, if I don't set a time in my day to connect with God and to get my mind focused on God, my mind is going to be on a million other things. So I need to actually make time in my life for God. The question is, are you making time in your day to get focused on God? to think on God and therefore to meet with God. First of all, get a plan. The second thing is find your music. I just really believe that a love for music in some way, shape or form is written into the DNA of all people. I just believe that it is. And trust me, your emotions can either work for you or against you. And what I've realized, if I find the right song, the song that moves me emotionally in the right way and makes it far easier for me to just get my mind on God. So I encourage you, get on YouTube, start searching, have a conversation with our creative pastor, Pastor Gabby, or some of our incredible worship leaders. They can help you out. Find your music. For me, I love listening to worship music without lyrics. It just gets me, it just gets my heart in the right position. It just helps me 
get my mind fixated on God. And trust me, honestly, it makes reading the Bible a whole lot more easy. So find your music. Also, here's another tip. Make it attractive. I mean, spending time with God doesn't have to be a drag. It can be awesome. It can be fun. Get a great chair. I was just speaking to Amy Robinson before, who's playing the keys behind me at the moment. And she was saying that she's got a chair that she loves. And when she gets in this chair, it just gets her in the zone and it makes it easier to connect with God. So gosh, find your chair. I don't know, find a spot where you feel really comfortable. Create an environment that's inviting. Make it easy for yourself. For me, I'll wake up in the morning and I make myself a nice coffee. I put the heater on. Man, I get my dressing gown on. I'm, I'm nice and warm. Um, I just make it as attractive as possible so I actually want to do it. Invest into it. Invest into it. Remember, meeting with God is so important. It's worth investing into. If you've got to pay a little bit of money to make meeting with God more attractive, do it. Do it. It's worth it. So there are a few tips and hopefully those tips can help you out a little bit. If you're trying to graft God into your life, failing to see the privilege of being able to meet with Him, and rarely fixing your mind on Him, you have to consider this question. Are you hiding your lack of intimacy with God behind empty religious traditions. People who really know God prioritize meeting with Him. Have you ever been a part of a close group of friends and like you thought you were really close? Like you thought you were really close. Like you love hanging out with these people. But then all of a sudden something happens and the group kind of disperses and you're left in a one-on-one -on -one with someone in the group. And as you start to talk, you realize that it's a bit awkward and you don't actually know each other as well as you thought you did. Has that ever happened to you? I know it's happened to me before. Now I want to paint this picture for you. Just imagine you're at church and, you know, you're with people, you're with friends at church and, you know, there's Ben, there's Zach, there's Ruth, there's Gabby, Charlene, there's Sarah, and there's Jesus. You know, you're with your church friends and all of a sudden something happens and the group is dispersed. And now, it's just you and Jesus. And, you know, you thought you were a really close group of friends. You thought you were all really close, but now it's just you and Jesus and you're, you're having a conversation and maybe you start to think, wow, actually, this is a little bit weird. Um, this is a little bit awkward. We're not as close as I thought we were. And maybe Jesus is looking at you and he's thinking, oh, we're not that close. And we could have been closer. You know, it's interesting what COVID has done for so many of us. I think it's been really eye-opening because COVID has dispersed us. And that's the reality of it. So I wonder how meeting with God is going for you. on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night when you sit in front of the TV and you know where church used to be this group dynamic where you're around other people and the sermon was great and the people are awesome and you're like, oh, praise Jesus. I'm so close to him. This is amazing. But now all of a sudden it's just you, it's the TV and it's Jesus. And I just want to ask you the question, do you still feel close to him? Is there that connection? Is there that deep, intimate relationship? I want to read a scripture to you out of Matthew 7. And um, 
I'm going to be honest, this is a very challenging scripture. And I'm not sharing it because I want to make anybody feel bad. I'm sharing it because I think it's so important. And for me, it's something that still challenges me now. And it's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is preaching the greatest message of all time. And he gets to this section in chapter 7 that we read. And in my Bible, there's a little subheading up the top and it says, I never knew you. And it says in verses 21 to 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then... I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now that is very challenging. And the thing I find so challenging about it is Jesus isn't talking to people who are obviously super far from him and don't know him. He's actually talking to people who call him Lord. He's talking to people who think they know him. But in this one-on-one conversation just between Jesus and this person, Jesus addresses, addresses the elephant in the room and says, I actually don't really know you. I actually have never really had personal experiences with you. You know, the word new or the word no that Jesus uses here, is the Greek word gnosko. And that can be translated a few different ways. And one of the ways that it can be translated is having a personal experience or having a firsthand experience with. So what Jesus is saying to this person who says, Lord, Lord, he's saying, you say, Lord, Lord, but to be honest, we've never had any personal experiences with one another. We've never had any first-hand experiences. Now, that's very challenging. But I just want to encourage you with this really important thought. Anyone can have personal first-hand experiences with Jesus. He made a way for it to happen. You know how first-hand personal experiences with Jesus happen? Through meeting with Him. Through meeting with Him one-on-one in your heart. So what personal experiences with God are you having? You have to remember that if they haven't been happening lately, they can start happening now. They can start happening today. It's not too late. It's never too late. Every moment can be a moment where you can have a first-hand experience with God. It doesn't need to be at church in the physical building. It doesn't need to be when you're in small group. It can happen anytime. It can be when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're stressing out and you feel anxiety because you hate your job. It can be when your kids are going nuts and you don't know what to do and it's homeschooling and you're like, oh my goodness, God, I can't do this. Maybe you're an only parent and you're struggling and it's hard and it's frustrating or you need to know that any moment can turn into a first-hand personal experience with Jesus. We meet with Jesus in our heart. It's open to anyone. It's open to you. Knowing God is so important. People who really know God are people who meet with Him. So what I want to do right now is I want to pray for people. I want to pray for people who honestly feel as though they haven't had any personal experiences with God lately. Maybe you feel as though, you know, COVID has put you into this position where It's a real struggle to even rock up to church, let alone make time every day to meet with Him. And you need help with that. I want to pray for you. 
Maybe you've started trying to graft God into your life rather than making your life all about God. Maybe you've forgotten the privilege of being able to meet with Him. If you fit into any of those um, any of those any of those things that I just said, I want to pray for you because this is important. This is really important. So let me pray. Dear God, I pray for every single person right now who's just acknowledging the fact that, to be honest, they haven't had any firsthand personal experiences with you lately and their meetings with you, to be real, have become quite religious. They've been all about putting on a facade, you know, they've been coming along to church when it was open or they've been coming along to small group. But to be honest, God, that's pretty much where it starts and ends. I want to pray for those people, God, who are making a decision today or who want to make a decision that they want to make you more of a priority in their lives. Father, I want to pray for people who honestly in their heart right now, they're not sure that they really know you. I want to pray for those people. God, I pray that you would just meet them where they're at. God, I pray that for those that make a decision right now in this moment that they're going to start prioritizing you more. Father, I just pray that you move. God, I just pray that you just light a fire in their heart. God, I just understand that at the end of the day, we need your grace for so many things. And God, I just think that sometimes we even need your grace to have the motivation to be able to meet with you, to pray, to read the Bible. Our lives are busy. So much is going on. God, I pray that you would extend to us the grace of having the motivation to meet with you. I pray for people who feel far from you today. God, I pray that you would just meet them where they're at. God, I pray that you would just let them know right now that you love them and that you have a plan for them, that you have a purpose for them. God, I pray for those who feel as though they've done things or, you know, they feel as though they're disqualified from being able to meet with you for whatever reason. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that right now that you would just break off that misconception. God, that you would just speak to them and let them know that you love them and that you want to know them more. God, I pray for everyone in our church. Father, I pray that we would be a church that just hungers after your heart. I pray that we would be a church that just authentically wants to go after you, not because it looks good to go after you, not just because we think it's the right thing, God, but I pray that we would be a church that hungers after you simply because we are just in love with you. I pray that we would be that type of church, God, that we would just prioritize you in our life, that we wouldn't try and graft you into anything, but we would just make our whole lives about you. Father, I thank you for how good you are. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the fact that we are doing church online right now and you are in the room. You're in everyone's rooms. Holy Spirit, you're moving. You're speaking to people. You're breaking chains. You're taking veils off of people's heads so that they can see you and hear you again. God, you're moving. God, I thank you for the privilege of being able to know you. I thank you for Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you came and you died for us so that we could know you, so that we could meet with you anytime, anywhere. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much for that. God, we love you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. And I also want to pray for people who have never made a decision to follow Jesus before. Those people who are listening right now to this message, and honestly, you know that you don't know God. You've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You've never accepted Jesus into your heart. I wanna pray for you and I wanna give you that opportunity. Because the truth is that 
Jesus died on the cross for your sin. He died for you. He took your place on the cross. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. Giving your life to Jesus isn't this thing that we do just so we could go to heaven and have eternal life. That's one of the awesome things about it. But even greater than that, it's this, this, it's this relationship that we enter into with God. Everyone has a void in their heart if they don't know Jesus. And we try and fill that void with so many things. We try and fill it with relationships. We try and fill it with maybe our families or our jobs. We try and fill that void with so many things. But at the end of the day, the only thing that can fill that void in you is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So right now, I'm going to give you that opportunity. All you have to do is repeat after me as I pray. All you got to do is just say these words. So repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died for me. Today I invite you into my heart. I accept you as Savior and Lord of my life. I repent of my sin and choose to follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Hey, if you made a decision to follow Jesus for the very first time, I just want to say that that is the best decision that you will ever make in your whole entire life. And we are so excited for you. And we actually want to connect with you. So you'll see that in the chat, um, there's an option for you to click the I accept button, hit that button. There's also a form that you can fill in. And I encourage you to fill in that form because like I said, we want to connect with you. This journey with Jesus um, isn't something that we just do in isolation on, on our own. I mean, there is a part of that, but there's also an aspect of community. And we want to connect with you and we want to journey with you. So please fill in that form for us. Church, I hope that you have enjoyed the message. But more importantly than that, I hope that God has spoken to you. And please make time in your week to meet with God. Make time in your week to focus on Him, to get your heart fixated on Him. It's so important. I love you so much. We love you so much. I hope you have a great week and I will see you soon.
you in the waiting and trust in you. Thank you for the word that has been shared today and we just pray that you would use it, that you would speak to us so clearly this week. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. hope that you were greatly encouraged by the word today and that you felt God speaking to you so powerfully. Why don't you let us know how God spoke to you through the message today or how you encountered his presence during worship. You know, there are so many amazing volunteers who make our church great and we want to continue to encourage them and say thank you to them for all the time sacrifices they make to to help Bright Church run. 
So if you feel like encouraging your small group leader, maybe a kids team leader or someone on the production team, you can fill in an encouragement card right now and let them know how much you appreciate them. If you're not part of a small group, please get in one. It is so important because life is so much better in community. So you can head to brightchurch.com and sign up for a small group today. I hope that you have a great start to the week and we'll see you next week.